Lisa Mar. Um, on this coming Wednesday, the moving van is going to pull up to my house, and my worldly possessions are being taken off to New Hampshire, where I'm returning, having come from there uh, to Freehold in Monmouth County 41 years ago. And I'm leaving New Jersey, and in celebration of my exit, there isn't anything that I would have rather have chosen to do than to stand up before an audience and talk about Christ Church. Because all through the 90s, um, this parish meant a lot to me, and it was, the building fell on my shoulders almost literally. And in the course of working on the building, we uh, engaged an architect named Margaret Westfield, who's sitting here in the second row. Stand up, Margaret. a few of her references, I uh, talked to a woman named Edie Rorman from Trinity Old Swedes Church in South Jersey, which had just finished a major roof truss project and restoration project, and she said, I thought we hired an architect, but we really gained a friend, and that's exactly uh, my relationship to Margaret. The world has not been the same since I first met her, under conditions I'll tell you about during the course of the talk. So this, can everybody see okay? It's nice and clear? Very good. Um, I titled this, The Long Life of the Landmark Sacred Space. And indeed, it has had a long life, and it's been through a lot. But there have always been reasons why things were done, most of the time. I'm going to pose a question to the audience beforehand. What does Christ Church share in common architecturally with majestic St. Paul's Cathedral in London? Now I'm going to come back to this question at the end of the lecture, and I want people to come up with ideas of what they think that link might be. Okay? Here's the Christ Church that I first met in the mid-90s, um, before we had done any work on it, and it looks very similar today, and it has looked that way uh, for a very long time. Very familiar building uh, to the Shrewsbury Four Corners, to Monmouth County, and to the history of 18th century church architecture in America. But that's not how it looked in the beginning. Here's a sketch of the Shrewsbury Four Corners taken down between 1797 and 1805. And this is how the church looked in the beginning. It was just a big shoebox. It had two front doors, an elaborate cupola over the west gable, and then the side elevations were the same. But this drawing tells us a few details about the building. Number one, the front doors appear to have been painted white, or a very light color. And the rest of the building is probably weathered cedar shingles uh, uh, to a silvery dark gray color. And that's, then the uh, windows and the window trim also appear to be painted white as the, uh, the doors are. And that would have been a particularly typical 18th century paint job. Uh, you do the doors, you do the windows, you do the window trim, maybe the cornices and a few other details, possibly the cupola because it's so exposed, but the rest of the building was left to weather. It's only in the 19th century that we started applying paint to our churches in Monmouth County. Some of them were painted barn red, some of them were painted white. Uh, Christ Church apparently went to white. A church of this type uh, we think when we go to London, of all of the great masterpieces by Sir Christopher Wren after the fire and all of the, the monumental churches, but in fact this is one uh, that was built in the northern suburbs of, of London at St. Marylebone, or Marylebone, or however you wish to pronounce it. And very similar to Christ Church. You've got the cupola on the west gable, four windows down the sides, uh, just a single entrance instead of two. This small parish church is typical of a whole class of small parish churches in and around London and elsewhere in England that are not so dissimilar from the way Christ Church was, with one major exception. This church was built of timber framing and wood shingles, and most of the London churches are built of brick or stone. This building was superseded by another parish church, a much larger and grander one in the early 19th century, but it stood until 1949 when they decided to turn it into a park. So what do we know about this building? We know it was started in 1769, Easter week of 1769, the vestry met to uh, resolve the issues regarding the construction of the building, and uh, they gave approval to it. They had money in hand from two lotteries, 
Um, there had been uh, some collections taken and some contributions, and they had enough to get going. So construction began in 1769. This is the cornerstone, which is in the south, uh, south east, southwest corner of the foundation. And for years and years and years, people thought that that stood for Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, 1769. Does anyone know who the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts was? Some do. They were the organization that sponsored all of the Anglican missionaries who came to America in the 18th century. Up until the time of the Revolution, they were paying salaries, they were providing uh, funds, <coughs> uh, they uh, gave libraries, and but you had to go to England for ordination and come back because there were no bishops in America before the Revolution. But anyway, in studying this in a strong ranking light, that's definitely an S, but that is definitely not a P. And to me, that looks like an M. So I interpret that as Samuel Cook Missionary, 1769. Samuel Cook was the rector at the time that the church was built, and uh, it's entirely appropriate for him to put his own initials on the uh, on the, uh, the the cornerstone. But if you walk around the building, what's left from that 18th century uh, structure? First of all, all the window openings on the two sides of the church are original, plus the Palladian window behind the altar. They're all 18th century parts. There have been uh, replacements of some of the the keystones at the top, some of the moldings have been replaced over the years, but you can see at some point they've been cut off. Uh, the molding returns that would come out here, probably in the shape of the, uh, of the profile of the molding coming out, or it could have been a bar all the way across to separate the fan light from the sash windows that were below it. It's hard to say from that one sketch. So the window openings are original. The magnificent uh, cornice around the building with that beautiful plastered cove and all of those elaborate moldings and also up the gable end of the building, all original. Many of the shingles are original, although the, the south wall has been replaced and the west wall has been replaced. There are originals on the north wall and uh, on the east wall of the reset. And of course, the landmark cupola that crowns the tower in front of the church. From, oops, sorry. From there up is the 18th century work, including the weather day. One of the, in the interior, one of the crowning glories of this building was its East Palladian window, which used to be in the wall that now marks the chancel uh, arch. Uh, it's been moved back uh, at a later time to talk about. It's Doric order. The whole building was designed to the Doric order, both the, front, the original front doors and the Palladian window and some of the other detailing in the building. Um, and this is the only building in Monmouth County put up before the Revolution that represented any of the five formal orders of architecture. So it stood out even in its own day. Note down here, you've got the base moldings here, and then there are pedestals below it that uh, anchor the window to the floor. And then you've got this beautiful row of half balusters uh, underneath to give wonderful definition to what was, a, for Monmouth County, a very sophisticated architectural composition. Most of the elements of that window still survive uh, behind us. There are those nice triglyphs and metopes. Does anyone know what a triglyph and a metope is? Margaret, not you don't count. <laughs> <laughs> the triglyphs are those panels right there and there and there. There are three parts to a triglyph. And the metope is the blank space between them. Okay? So that's one of the hallmarks of the Doric order, triglyphs and metopes. And of course, the two uh, very important canopy pews in each corner of the front of the building. Um, in these were for many years, for decades, for generations, called rector's pew and governor's pew. But it's a matter of record that no colonial governor ever stepped foot inside this building. Think back to the 18th century. All of the pews were considered private property. And so where do you put strangers when they come to your church? You put them in those pews. 
And in other pew plans from the 18th century that survive, they're called public pews. All right, so a governor might sit in them, but visiting dignitaries, visiting strangers, people staying at the Blue Ball Tavern at the Allen House across the street might all occupy those pews because every one of the ones out here was sold to private individuals and was considered private property at the time. But they are magnificent examples of local joinery. Uh, the columns, beautiful what's called entesis, the way they uh, taper as they go up to the top to accentuate the feeling of height. The great bed of, of moldings and the pilasters that attach them to the walls in an imitation of the columns on the corner. This is all first-rate 18th century joinery. And if the outside of the windows was original, so are the inside buildings. So you have a nice keystone here that, re that reflects the one over the Palladian window. Uh, here are those moldings that have been clipped off again. If I can go back, that's what was probably what they were like right there, where they cut the profile of the molding and it projected out over the window and they were just cut off at, uh, at a later date. Have any of you who are members of this congregation sat in one of these pews and wondered on a Sunday morning, what holds the ceiling up? Anybody done that? No. People look up and they just assume there's something up there holding up the ceiling. This is the type of truss that was used in this building. It's called a raised bottom cord truss. That's the bottom cord. And it's raised. It doesn't go from the top of the wall to the top of the wall. It's up here in the middle of the rafters. And it's got a king post in the middle, which is there not to support the ridge, but to keep the bottom cord from sagging in the middle. All right? And then they have what in the 18th century language was called hammer beams. These are not like the medieval hammer beams that we're familiar with that go out to the tops of the walls. And then there are various braces put in and some uh, features that are going to help hold the ceiling. What's the benefit of this truss? Number one, it, it accommodates a graceful curved ceiling. Right? If there were timbers going straight from the top of the wall to the top of the other wall, there would be a flat ceiling in here, and flat ceilings always have the visual appearance of sagging in the middle. So that's one of the benefits of an arched ceiling like this one. It also is rather sparing of material, and it allows for a 26 uh, degree roof pitch where the more typical churches have uh, 45 uh, in the area. So the church was designed by a man named Robert Smith, who was the leading uh, builder architect in British North America in the third uh, quarter of the 18th century. He was born in Scotland and apparently spent time in London, although previous authors on his life and career have fought vigorously about, on that theory. But if you look at his buildings, he's very familiar with London techniques, London design, his hospital designs, his courthouse designs, his uh, uh, almshouse designs, and his church designs all reflect a particular group of mid-18th century uh, London area buildings. So he designed at least seven new churches during his career, and there are several others that are attributed to him with greater or lesser integrity. Five of those seven churches survive today, and four of them use the raised bottom cord truss. This building is 38 feet wide. His widest uh, use of that truss was 65 feet, and that building still stands. It's uh, the old St. Paul's in Philadelphia, long since used as an Episcopal office building rather than as a church. But Robert Smith didn't invent that truss. This is a plate from a book called The British Carpenter, first published in 1733, written by a man named Francis Price. And here is the truss that uh, Robert Smith used here in America. Whether he got it from studying London buildings, participating in the construction of London buildings, or out of one of the leading how-to books for carpenters in the 18th century, we don't know. But it became his, um, his uh, signature for virtually all of the churches that he designed. Several of the others that don't stand, there's uh, documentary evidence to suggest they had arch ceilings in them. Um, but I've crawled into all five of his original surviving churches and can verify that 
Four of them have this. Now, how many of you have served on a church vestry? Raise your hands. Oh, almost everybody. Have you ever encountered controversy in a church vestry? Okay, so that's not new either. In Easter week of 1769, there was a very forceful member of the Christ Church vestry who took uh, issue with the design of the church for, by Robert Smith. His name was Josiah Holmes, and he was church warden, clerk of the vestry, very important person. He had been trained in life, uh, early in life as a silversmith, and then uh, later became a merchant partner with his father, and then took over the merchant business altogether. Josiah Holmes was not a carpenter, but he had two sons who were. And um, after the, at the meeting where the church design was being discussed, he wrote a very um, vituperative uh, letter to the vestry. Josiah Holmes, not approving of the method concluded for the building of the church and for diverse other reasons, desires to be excused from serving or acting as one of the committee for carrying on the work which request is refused him, whereupon he thinking it too great a hardship to be obliged and laid under the disagreeable necessity of acting against his own reason, also thinking himself and others ill-used, etc., he therefore declines and absolutely refuses to act either as a member of said committee or as church warden until he can at least be better reconciled to the method and proceedings determining to have no manner of concern in ordering or carrying on the said work, but only to remain barely a spectator, according to which determination his name is erased in the minutes of the vestry. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a drawing that survives in the Holmes family papers at the Monmouth County Historical Association, and it is definitely a design for a church. Uh, it's got a barrel vault in the center, two rows of columns holding up, galleries on either side, and there's that 45 degree uh, roof pitch again with a very strange arrangement of timber on it, and I must say, I've never seen anything like that that was actually built, but it probably would have stood, all right? And then there's a second drawing in the Holmes family papers, a side elevation, the framing diagram of a church. And if you look at the, the proportion of the, of the uh, end elevations to the side elevations, what the Holmeses were reacting to was a church very much like this one, which is Old Testament Presbyterian Church outside of Freehold, built in 1752 and 53. So they were taking uh, traditional local carpentry and trying to make a new church for Christ Church out of it, where Mr. Smith had some other uh, leading edge ideas. At that same meeting where Mr. Holmes stormed out, the vestry then went on and ordered that the building of the church shall be carried on and that the roof, etc., shall be framed according to the draft of Mr. Smith of Philadelphia. This kind of documentation from the 18th century is extremely rare. Uh, a design conflict uh, in a church congregation. So those, those quotes are just beyond belief. But I think it's a key to Mr. Holmes's personality. Construction of Christ Church did not happen overnight. There were money raising issues. They had trouble getting glass and nails from England uh, because of some non-importation agreements. Um, the, the project lingered. The workmen would go off and do more lucrative private projects before coming back here. So it took until the spring of 1774 before the church was ready for use. And um, I'll read what uh, Reverend Cook wrote back to London, uh, to the SPG. I can with truth affirm that I've got one of the most complete and best finished churches in this province, and what adds much to the credit of my congregation, the accounts are all settled, the materials all paid for, and the workmen satisfied to the uttermost farthing. Now listen to this. I was kindly assisted at the opening of it by Dr. Ashmoody. He was from New York City, and he was the rector of Trinity Parish from New York, Mr. Beach, that's Abraham Beach from New Brunswick, and Mr. Ayers, that's William Ayers from Spotswood, everything was conducted with great regularity and decency. Can you imagine getting four priests to appear in one place in colonial New Jersey uh, to dedicate a country church? That was a real testament to uh, what the 
community, the larger Anglican community, thought of this parish and the Reverend Cook that they would make the journey here for its, its opening. They couldn't consecrate it because, yet again, we had no bishops, so only bishops can consecrate churches. Before we go any further, I need to introduce you to one of Robert Smith's other commissions. This is landmark St. Peter's Church Episcopal on Society Hill in Philadelphia, built between 1758 and 61. And it shares a lot of details in common with Christ Church. There's that lovely Palladian window, theirs is much larger, on the east elevation. And over the west gable, there's Kipola, which we know had two bells in it, okay? This is a floor plan of St. Peter's. Um, this is the ground floor and these are the galleries. And notice that there's a chancel in the east, right in front of the Palladian window, but there's something called a pulpit over here on the west end, and then behind it, a vestry room, a vestry. In that time, it was vesting, not vestry. And up in the gallery, you've got another level of a pulpit in the bell room where the ropes came down, and an organ in the north gallery. Well, St. Peter's is still relatively intact today. In the very earliest years of the 19th century, the organ was moved around and put on uh, pillars over the chancel. That is the 18th century organ case, but it's got an early 20th century instrument inside of it. And if we turn around and look the other way, there's the pulpit at the uh, west end of the church. Reading desk at this level, pulpit at this level, sounding board above, magnificent uh, detailing, uh, surrounded, surmounted by something that looks like the paneling over, over a fireplace, and overlooking at all the Penn family coat of arms. So Robert Smith has created this magnificent architectural composition, but why? And why have the, the pulpit on one end and the chancel on the other, even to this day? Well, that's because behind that pulpit, there is a brick tower, an internal brick tower that rises up through the church and it connects with the timber framing at the west end of the building to support the weight of the cupola and two bells. Now, uh, this is a, a very poor drawing, but there's the tower. It goes right up there and then these are some of the iron parts that support their, their truss, which I said was 60 feet wide. When we did the National Register nomination for Christ Church, I think it was 95, um, this is what we thought the floor plan was like. This is the, the west end, this is the east end. There's the Palladian window. We know from existing pew lists, not diagrams, but lists, that there were 16 square pews, so we have those along the walls, and 24 long pews, all right? And so we put 24 long pews in the, in the middle. And there's the little tombstone that's right here. And we placed a pulpit right in the center in front of the Palladian window because there's 18th century graphic illustrations of Christ Church Philadelphia, uh, St. Paul's Chapel in New York, and that's exactly where they put all of their big uh, pulpits. We now know that this is wrong, okay? When we did the work in the church in the mid-90s, the remains of a wooden tower were found under the organ, all right? And so there would have been an internal wooden tower here that went all the way up to the roof trusses on the west gable of this building and to support the weight of that cupola, which eventually got a bell. And uh, so there was probably a pulpit on this end, chancel on this end, and then these all have to be made narrower because that tombstone actually was right next to where the video camera is uh, in the floor. When we were working on the church, we pulled up that patch to see why it was there, and there was a, a, a recess in the framing underneath it, the exact same shape as the tombstone up here in the front. So the chancel went to about there from where the columns are, which is a very large space. There could have been a pulpit on this end instead of that end, but there definitely was an internal tower and it had the staircase in the tower that went up to two little balconies, one on either side, uh, accessed via the stair inside it. Let's jump forward to the 1840s. This was the Bishop of New Jersey, George Washington Dome, from 1832 to 1859. 
Bishop Dome had limitless energy. He founded churches where there were no people. Uh, he gathered people together. He founded a girls' school, which still exists. He founded a, a boys' college, which uh, never really got off the ground. And he was just a bundle of energy. And uh, he also became an ardent supporter of what was called the Oxford Movement in the early 1840s, uh, which was really a Tractarian movement, but it resulted in the return to the Anglican Communion a lot of the features of Roman worship, all right? And some of them are more frequent celebration of Eucharist instead of weekly or monthly. It was uh, monthly or yearly, I mean, it could be weekly, it could be daily. A resumption of the daily office, uh, the use of candles on uh, altars, uh, vested choirs and clergy, uh, a whole long list of things that the Oxford movement brought into the Episcopal Church. Now, that dichotomy between high church and low church began then, and it continues to this day, and uh, in various other uh, liturgical arguments. But uh, the conservative wing of the Episcopal Church decided to attack three of the leading high church bishops. Bishops Onderdonk of uh, New York and his brother in Philadelphia, who was Bishop of Pennsylvania, and Bishop Doan. The two Onderdonks got sacked, but Doan fought back and won. And it took him almost 10 years to, to finally be vindicated. Uh, vindicated, thank you, I'm having a senior moment. Uh, so, because the Diocese of New Jersey became a high church diocese, that meant that the demands on the churches changed, all right? You needed more chance and space, you needed a lot of things, and uh, this is what Christ Church looked like in the 1840s. There's the little extension on the back, which created a deeper chancel, uh, but other one, and window, green window shutters had been put on the building and on the cupola. And it had now been painted white, um, but otherwise the exterior was much the same. But if we look inside, all the pews were reconfigured to these slip pews, at which are made up out of parts of the old pews. There was a larger chancel created here with uh, an altar in the center. So the focus now is on Eucharist and liturgy, not necessarily so much emphasis on preaching, endlessly long sermons, although Don was guilty of that too. Um, we'll ignore this end of the church for now. So the entire arrangement of the interior of the church was changed to focus on the east end of the building. Like I said, they're made up out of the old pew parts. There's one of the square pews pieced out. Here's one of the long pews cut off. And notice how they're carefully paired uh, through the building so that the, the parts match when you look at them from the, the choir off. By the way, the, the builder who did this, his name was Peter Haddon, went bankrupt the following year, and among his assets was one old lot, one old, one lot of old pew doors. We think we know where they came from. <laughs> Let me read what Bishop Dillon had to say um, when he came to actually consecrate the church for the first time. On Thursday, 16 January, 1845, I consecrated Christ Church Shrewsbury. It has now been materially enlarged, that's the chancel, thoroughly repaired and entirely remodeled in its interior arrangements. I think we can agree with that. From being uncomfortable, inconvenient, and unslightly to a degree seldom realized, he really didn't like the old arrangement. It is now one of the most commodious and beautiful of our sacred edifices. And then uh, in, re in following years, he described Christ Church as being uh, the most English of all of the New Jersey parishes in its appearance. So uh, Bishop Dunn, I think, is reacting to pulpit at one end, chancel at the other, uh, in a very odd arrangement for that interior tower. After the Civil War, the pace of change at Christ Church started picking up. Um, in 1867, uh, stained glass was given to the church, uh, used from St. Thomas Church in New York City. They had just moved uptown to their current location on uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, and the old church, which was downtown, uh, was dismantled. And although it had burned uh, in uh, the 1830s, I believe, 
Um, they rebuilt at the old location and used it for a few more years. Now, it just so happens that a man named George DeHart Gillespie was on the vestry at St. Thomas, and he was also on the vestry here. And he made arrangements for St. Thomas Fifth Avenue to give the old stained glass from the old church to this church. And uh, unfortunately, they then had to fit them into the 18th century window openings because those had not changed. And the, the other church had typical Gothic dances. So they were sent to a firm named George Morgan in New York and they were paid to reconfigure them so that they would fit into these window openings. All right, so this, this glazing program um, dates from 1867, but the windows date from the 1840s, actually. And then, of course, Gillespie himself gave a new window for the chancel, which is behind the screen, still there, uh, very high quality uh, glass uh, as a memorial uh, to his family. As far as I know, and Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the earliest interior view of the church. And it was taken sometime after 1883 because it shows this elaborate redecoration of the interior with all this painted and stenciled work uh, on the ceiling, some of it on the walls, some of it down here on the wainscoting. All of the pews were grained to look like imitation oak. And um, the chancel was richly decorated in deep blue with gold stars all over the walls. Um, the chancel furnishings, the font, the altar, the eagle lectern, and a lot of the other things that you can't see very clearly in this picture were all donated mostly by George Gillespie in 1883. And virtually everything that you see in that chancel is still either in the church or the parish house to this day. Still around. So it became very heavily Victorianized. And a chandelier, first oil, then gas was put in. And then in 1874, they decided to put a clock in the building. And it was known in the beginning as the Shrewsbury Town Clock. And uh, in order to accommodate it, they built the tower, because the weights have to fall a very far distance uh, as you wind it weekly. And uh, they moved physically the cupola from the west gable to the top of the new tower. All right? And they did that by cutting away the end of the gable, the framing of it, taking away the, and moving it forward <coughs> and then raising it up to where it belonged. And it's higher than in its original location. But all of the support structure and the entire cupola and the renovating, everything is the 18th century fabric sitting on an 1874 tower. Okay? Now there was a race between Freehold and Shrewsbury to see who could get their clock running first. This is the spring of 1874. And the Freehold clock was going to be in the courthouse, uh, on top of the courthouse. Freehold won, but not by very much. Uh, Shrewsbury came in second on that one. Now with the cupola moved forward, oh here's the uh, clockworks for those of you who have never climbed up uh, the tower and look at it. They're made by the E. Howard Company in Boston, Massachusetts, and their Bob tells me it's keeping perfect time even to this day. And although they don't have to climb up there to wind it every week anymore, they now have a button they can push. With the cupola gone, up onto the tower, what happened to the interior tower? They could take it away, and it uh, was gone by 1879, when a much larger pipe organ was put in, still here, um, to replace a very small instrument that sat on a very small balcony in front of the interior wooden tower. It would basically be the front part of the current uh, balcony and part of it. So the old tower's gone, taken away, and they were able to put in this much, much larger, more powerful pipe organ, uh, which has served the parish faithfully since 1879. The appearance of the building changed from time to time. Here it is in its gray mood. Uh, we found ample evidence of this gray color on the building when we were working on it in the mid-90s. Um, a medium gray color with a darker gray trim. Then by the 1930s, the Colonial Revival had come along, and so now it's painted white, because Colonial buildings in the 1920s were supposed to be painted white. And the interior, the interior had gone through the same transformations. 
1906, two large pieces of the plaster ceiling came crashing down. And uh, an inspection up there showed a lot of water leakage uh, uh, and le loose plaster. The keys that hold the plaster in place were breaking, whatever. So this very elaborate tin ceiling was put in, still using the arch uh, from the 18th century. And it was put in by a man named Daniel H. Cook, who was from Eatontown. Do any of you remember a member of the congregation named Fran Dice? Yeah. Oh, yes. That was Fran Dice's grandfather, who did who put the ceiling in the building. And then there had been uh, this wall color was a soft gray with a lot of darker gray stenciling around the uh, the wainscoting over the chancel arch and some, some other fancy decorations. But all the woodwork had gone white instead of uh, to replace the oak graining of the Victorian period. Oh, and it also got electrified with this large chandelier. Notice the chandelier had all kinds of dingle dangles on it, I mean prisms, uh, to magnify the light. Um, there's more on that coming. There was also a colonial revival back put on, on the Victorian altar and a few other changes. Comes the 1950s and 60s. First off, there was desperate need for a larger sacristy and a robing area for the vested choir. So the, the chancel extension was extended, almost doubled in depth, or maybe even a little more. So here's the choir robing area, and here's the uh, enlarged sacristy. This was the sacristy beforehand. And then, the sides, the side pews from the chimneys forward were taken out and two um, stalls were put in. And the stalls were never really used for their intended purpose. Uh, they were kind of no man's land between the people I used to sit here and for the people here and the chancel area. There were some other changes made too. The chancel floor which had had four steps to get up to the altar rail, was dropped down. And because of that, the 1844 round columns had to go because they weren't long enough, and they put in these square ones. And this is probably a much more successful chancel arrangement with an altar facing forward. But if you look carefully behind the altar, they took out the base of the Palladian window in the row of half balusters, which was original 18th century work. Um, and it's tragic that they, uh, that they stripped down that magnificent window by removing all of that elaborate base uh, material and the, and the beautiful balusters. So notice also that by then, all of the prisms are gone off the uh, chandelier, uh, making it, I think, rather unsightly. <laughs> Ugly. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Fast forward. In February of 1996, I was a speaker at a conference in Philadelphia sponsored by the Association for Preservation Technology, of which Margaret was then an officer. And the conference was held at the uh, Art Street Friends Meeting, uh, which is a favorite place for those kinds of conferences. And I spoke about Robert Smith, and everybody else on the program talked about various approaches to failed roof trusses and steeples. So um, along about March, we had an opportunity to acquire a new chandelier to replace the, what by then, ugly one in the center of the building. And we acquired this magnificent, original, mid-18th century English or Irish cut glass chandelier, typical of what might have been in the building in the beginning. The, on Holy Week of that year, which was April, Monday, April 1st, 1996, a man they, named David Martin and I went up into the attic of the church to inspect the hook to see if it would be suitable for hanging the new chandelier uh, and taking the old one down. This wire down here is what held the old chandelier up. It went down underneath the timber to a hook that was through the tin and then so forth. This is the old gas pipe to one of the gas uh, chandeliers that was in the center of the building at one point. And then these are the electrified versions of the 20th century. But look what's happened. 
all of a sudden, this a timber split and dropped. And that meant that the truss was no longer doing its job. Uh, that when a truss relaxes and the parts are no longer connected to each other, it can't carry the load. So what happens? The load goes to the next truss. And it overburdens that, and it goes on to the next truss. Um, what caused the breaks? It wasn't the slate roof. The slate roof had been on the building since 1906, so it was carried very successfully for over 100 years. Um, oh, sorry, 1906, 90 years. And um, it was a 30-inch, very heavy, wet, sticky snowstorm that hit in January of 1996 that caused all of this, because these were fresh breaks. There wasn't anything old or oxidized about any of the breaks that we found. I grabbed the flashlight from Dave Martin and I bolted for the office to call an engineering firm in Philadelphia called Keystone Hood, who I had met in my Robert Smith research days and at the conference and, and knew one of their principals very well. And the next day, we had a contractor and, uh, and the engineers here. We put lights in the attic so we could see. We put planks down so that we could go from truss to truss without having to balance on the plaster ceiling framing. And this is what we began to find. This is truss six. This is the one that's right under, right above the chandelier. Truss seven had totally slipped. All right, remember, the load went from truss six, and it went to truss seven, and it couldn't do the job of two, so it broke it. And then we went to truss eight, which broke in roughly the same location. By the time we got done, there were severe breaks in trusses four through nine. Mine is the end one up here. And the whole building was in a very precarious position. Remember, this is Holy Week. The contractors got to work. I contacted Margaret's former contract, uh, contact at Trinity Old Suite, Z.D. Warman, and I bought the scaffolding that they had just taken out of their church because their work was now finished. And that was installed to support the ends of the two trusses that were right up here. We had to take down tin in order to go up through it and to support those trusses so they couldn't fall. We also tried to return the function of the trusses uh, with, remember, this king post in the middle isn't there to support the ridge. It's there to keep the, that timber that split from sagging. So we used what are called come uh, up over the ridge, down underneath. This is the same location as before. And all of the, all of the breaks got strain gauges put on them. This one, a rather crude one. Two sticks that are going past each other, one nailed to the upper part and one nailed to the lower. We closed the church on Easter Sunday of that year. We got back in the building. We had Easter and Good Friday and all of the things that go with Holy Week in the latter part of the, the week. And then on Easter Sunday, everybody ceremonially carried everything out of the sacristy and elsewhere over to the parish house and turned the building over to the contractors the following day. We were able to get back in the building for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with the use of folding chairs in the center of the church because the pews had to be taken out. So during that whole year, we did a tremendous amount of work from the beginning, from the bottom of this building up. Here's how we fixed the trusses that broke on the ends. And there were two up here that broke on that end, two over here that broke on that end. And we took those come-alongs and we wrapped them around the king post. And then we went down and one of them went around the end. And the other one wrapped around there to snug things in so it couldn't uh, go any further. And that's the ratchet that you use on a come-along to tighten them up so that the building wasn't going to spread anymore. So between the come-alongs, and, the, and the, uh, the scaffolding, we secured the building and were able to use it. We spent all of 96 diagnosing the building before we closed it uh, the following spring. And um, every Saturday, I went up into the building to check the strain gauges to make sure there had been no movement in any of the, uh, in any of the breaks. There was movement in the one over the chandelier, that was the bad one, where the, the, the timbers were just simply fractured, but not enough to close the building. Uh, so we continued to use it. But then the remit was expanded to find everything that's wrong with this building 
and to put it together in a package and get insurance recovery, seek grants, raise funds among ourselves, and steal a buck wherever we could find one. And this is an example of the south sill, actually just the other side of the chimney. That's supposed to be a, hollow, a, a, a solid timber, and it's hollow. So the whole weight of the truss and the roof and everything that comes down on this column is sitting on a piece of rock. And there had been a lot of movement along this wall, historically movement, and that could have also contributed to the difficulties with the trusses, because when you start changing the relationship between the posts and the trusses and the angles and the heights, it stresses out the truss, which can, is, was very inflexible. So the snowstorm may have just been that little extra drop that caused the breaks. They may have been in, uh, in preparation for quite some time. Now, this timber is the floor joist. That's the flooring of the church. That's the back side of the wainscoting along the outside walls. And that joist, floor joist, is hollow. And that's called tunnel rock. And I could take a broomstick and run it in there, and it would go all the way up to the broom, and I still didn't get to the end of the tunnel rock. It was back from the, from the sills uh, out as far as the aisle. Uh, and the worst part of the tunnel rock, bug, caused by bugs, was from the chimney to the back corner on the south side of the building. From the sills to the cupola, everything uh, we took apart needed attention. This is the mass that holds the weather vane on the top of the cupola, which had been struck by lightning in 1905. And here's the, the burn uh, residue of it that was still there, and things had just been tacked on it in order to uh, get the shape of the, of the mass back and to uh, hide the damage from the, uh, from the fire. So here's what it looked like after we got done. We, we replaced the entire south sill, the west sill, the power sills, and approximately half of the eastern sill. Two-thirds of the north sill had been replaced in the 19th century. We discovered that when, uh, when we were taking the building apart. So here's the nice new solid sill, where the posts had to be leveled and trimmed on the bottom, because by now they were at different heights. And then they're held on to the new sills with steel, uh, steel brackets. And we reattached the, uh, the, the uh, floor joists using micro lamps. I wanted to use steel, but that's a vote of the vestry. Uh, I lost, they won. And we used micro lamps, it was cheaper. And then also connected to the sand and the, the uh, sills with, uh, with metal brackets and bolts. So that uh, other than the sill timbers themselves and the flooring, 100% of the original fabric is still there. It's just being assisted in doing its job. The solution in the, in the attic was a very different one and a much more complicated one. Our engineers designed a steel truss bridge that goes from the tower to right over the chancel arch. Then there's a second one that goes from the top of the chancel arch out to the walls, and then there are two columns uh, embedded inside the walls. Right? So it's a big T-shaped steel construction. Anyone who's ever been in the attic knows that there's a lot of steel up there. It all came semi-assembled or in pieces, and the steel workers had to check everything out and dismantle it, because every piece of what's in the attic came through a hole approximately a foot wide and maybe 18 inches high. And we had some rolling track up there, and they would put the pieces on the rolling track and zip it down the attic to where it belonged and bolt it in place. These are the crew examining the steel as it was delivered. Here's what we had to do to the interior of the church to support the steel before it could support itself as we assembled it and as the bridge grew down the length of the church. Here are the first pieces being bolted together at the tower end. That's where we started. And this is what the finished product looks up there. There's a, two, two trusses that go the full length of the building, and they're heavy. But the engineers designed it in such a way, using a very early version of uh, computer-assisted design, so that no piece of steel in, intersected with a piece of wood. So 100% of the wood is still up there, and uh, the steel misses it everywhere. And that was a very sophisticated piece of engineering. 
as that bridge goes through the wooden trusses, there's a saddle that goes underneath the center of that truss that's connected to the steel above, and it was, uh, the tension was taken up just enough to make it snug. That single point of contact in the middle of the truss, under the king post, right where that one broke over the chandelier, transfers the entire weight of the church to the steel so that the, uh, the wood is no longer doing its job as a truss. It's there as a, a, what I would call a load collection system, transferring the weight of the roof and everything else that's up there to the steel, which carries it to the concrete foundations and footings that we put in uh, outside. The cupola, when we got it scaffolded, you could go up there and you could hook your foot on the, on the cupola and get it rocking back and forth. Uh, very readily. <laughs> All eight of the posts that formed the octagon uh, were rotted. Some of them fatally so, almost. So each one of those was backed with a steel column. Here's one being lifted up very high and about to be dropped down through there to be put in place uh, in the drum of the, uh, the cupola. And the frame was built at the top of it to hold the, uh, the dome and the weather vane which had to be refashioned uh, using original materials, original techniques uh, from scratch. Some of the other things we did was we reactivated the south uh, stove chimney for the new furnaces that were put into um, a new cellar. And we copied them from one of the early photographs of the church and we were even able to count the rows of uh, bricks in the photographs so that we have exactly the same number. We put flashings on the building, which it never had, and it was one of the reasons why there was so much severe water penetration over a long period of time everywhere we looked. There was only one remaining original keystone over the outside windows, and that's over this one. All the rest have now been replaced. Those on the south side were replaced in the early 90s, and we replaced three of them on the north side. We also elected to say goodbye to those stalls that were on the, the two sides that were rarely used uh, and to put back <coughs> and we scrounged around the building, and particularly in the basement of the parish house, and we found enough parts of the old pews that every one of the old pews has old parts. All of the ends are old and there are, some of them are completely old and others, uh, at least so we can say, all of the 10 new pews that we put in, new old pews, all have old parts. We learned a lot about the history of the building, too. This is a piece of the wood roof. We, there, the 1906 slate roof came off. We were going to put a new one on, and we discovered that the 19th century shingle roof was still underneath. All right? And this is an example of the condition of the roof in 1906 when the plaster ceiling started falling down. How many pieces of tin in this picture have been slid in there to keep the, the water out? One, two, three, four in a patch maybe 24 inches square. And that was typical of the condition of the roof in 1906. No wonder water got in and the plaster started falling. We also got to see in color uh, what the painted decoration from 1881 was like. This is a piece over here. Um, the scrapping is what holds the tin in place, and then the, uh, the plaster would have long since come down if the tin wasn't there, because it's the nails that's holding the tin that's going into the wood lab of the 18th century plaster that is holding the plaster in place. We also ran into human remains when we made uh, a much neater basement from the old nasty uh, hole that had been dug for the big coal furnace. And we discovered that the people who had dug that pit had run into those same graves that we ran into uh, in 1906 when the furnace was put in. And they took all the bones that they disturbed and put them in a pit that was underneath the, the big hog of a furnace with the octopus arms that went to the various uh, floor registers. And then I believe while I was, in, uh, was working in Hong Kong that summer, uh, Mother Lisa actually did a reinterment ceremony under the building to put the remains back close to where they were. So this is what the building looked like when we were done. Uh, the pews were back in the corners. Um, 
The new chandelier was hanging on a rod made at the blacksmith shop at the deserted village of Allaire. And Bob reminds me that uh, at the time, I said the chandelier cost us uh, $10,000, but the hook cost us $1.2 million. <laughs> <laughs> and so it did. Now, remember in the beginning, I asked you the question, what architecturally links Christ Church to St. Paul's Cathedral? Margaret, you can't answer this question, but does anybody else want to make a guess? Doric order of the pediments and decoration. That's a good guess, Bob, but that's not the correct answer. <laughs> the clock. All right. The clock. Columns. No. There are two pairs of raised bottom cord trusses in St. Paul's Cathedral which span 50 feet. So they're not as wide as uh, Robert Smith used in Philadelphia, but they're 12 feet wider than Christ Church. Um, they're, again, the, the, the raised bottom cord truss allows you a greater uh, ceiling height uh, underneath. And they're located over the main entrance where there's a stone arch uh, above the stairs and above a large saucer dome right there over what is now the gift shop in, uh, in St. Paul's. So there are two pairs of raised bottom cord trusses in St. Paul's Cathedral, the west end of which was finished by 1705, and we have nine of them in this building, same thing. So what does Christ Church represent today? As I said in the beginning, it's one of five surviving churches designed by Robert Smith of Philadelphia, who was the leading um, builder architect in British North America in his life. Christ Church is one of only two Smith churches that retains original interior details, the other being St. Peter's in Philadelphia that we saw. It's a defining architectural landmark of the Shrewsbury Four Corners. This would be a very different community if this building were not located in this, look, in this spot. It's a landmark sacred space in continuous use for 250 years, except when closed periodically for repairs. <laughs> and the parish uh, possesses a unique collection of historical and liturgical artifacts from every generation, from the very early years of the 18th century to the present day, and you, you can't replace those kinds of layers of association uh, and affection to the, the history of a parish. I got there. I'll be happy to take questions. So you started to talk about the black and white tile. Not really. Um, the, black, the use of black and white tiles goes back to the 18th and 17th century, and probably the 16th. Um, the, the floor levels here, remember, there used to be four steps to get up to the altar rail. There was one at the corner, there was another row of pews in front of this one, so there was a diagonal step that went from the corner of the pew to the corner of the, uh, the canopy pew. Then there were two more just inside where this one is, and then another one to get up to the altar rail, which was very small and was in the very far back. The one that shows in the photograph looks to be a bronze, and it probably was part of the 1881 or 1883 redo of the whole chancel. But the, the, the use of the tiles, even though these are, are, are uh, modern tiles, the effect is one that you would find in the 18th century. They're really quite appropriate. Rick? I'm joking question. The, uh, Bones that were found under the um, heater, or the furniture, is it possible that they were interred outside the walls of the original church footprint? That's absolutely correct. There are remains of the foundation of the first church that was built in 1732 on this site. It was a brick church. We don't know very much about it, except that it was architecturally very advanced for this area. And it was, the fact that it was a brick building is amazing. And a mason from New York named Abraham Russell came down here to build the church and stayed. And he became one of the area's leading stone and brick masons of the first half of the 18th century. The foundation line for the first church is roughly under the edge of the outer pews uh, where these people are sitting. And there's maybe 20 feet or more of it still there. And so everything from that northern edge of those pews all the way over here was once graveyard. 
and there was a south entrance from that church that led into the graveyard and somewhere in that same area. So yes, the, there are interments probably under the whole building. When they, when they dug that ugly pit for the first furnace, they ran into maybe a half a dozen interments and what we ran into were the halves of those bodies that they didn't touch. All right, then they took the legs and other parts that they did interrupt and put them in that pit under the old coal furnace. So, second question is, these plaques that are on the church floor, they're not gravestones, or say they're memorial stones? They are gravestones, but they were here before the church was built, and so they were put in the aisles. Um, presumably, the people who are represented by those stones are somewhere in the same vicinity. We, met, we ran into a mix of female and male uh, remains. Uh, one of the skulls had a bullet hole in it, um, and, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. It could have been a militia accident, it could have been a hunting accident, it didn't have to be a murder case. But uh, they were all studied carefully and recorded, and somewhere in this parish archive you have the report of the archaeologist who did the work. Yes, sir? Uh, the numbers that are on the beach, they are all different. Sequence. Right. And I noticed that to be even more curious. Is that because they were rearranged or were they originally? Yes. As the paint the church was painted from time to time, the numbers were taken off, and there was a point where the pews became free and you could sit anywhere instead of owning your pew. And the painters would just arbitrarily put them back in any sequence. They are the original 1844 numbers. They've never been restored, they've never been overpainted, they're really quite wonderful. And then when we put these 10 pews back in, I had a box of numbers. So I did the same thing. I just randomly assigned them and, and had them uh, attached to the pews so that everyone would have a number. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. So was the At first it takes water and dampness. And then the bugs like water and dampness and they come in and they start to chop away. So it was a combination of significant leakage and water penetration over a very long period of time combined with very, very active insects. Okay, no one else? Thank you all for coming. Thank you.